So this is, a, as Sally mentioned, a slightly different format than some of them. We're going to have a panel discussion focusing on large-scale solar. And this is a series of projects that was funded uh, a few years ago by the Tomcat Center for Sustainable Energy. So let me just say a few words about the Tomcat Center and about this program of projects. Then I'm going to invite the panelists to come up here, and uh, we'll start the program. So uh, the Tomcat Center was established in 2009. Uh, we're in our fifth year, and its mission is to make electricity and transportation systems more sustainable. And we have a, a series of different activities that we do toward that mission. Uh, we uh, fund research, innovation transfer, education, and outreach activities. And what we're focusing on today here is one of our successful research activities, our seed grants focused on large-scale solar. Um, so you're going to be hearing just little bits, uh, short summaries of the large-scale solar uh, research that's taking place through this portfolio of projects. Um, what do I mean by large-scale solar? It means uh, deployment of solar technologies that's both solar photovoltaic and also concentrating solar power uh, at a utility scale, so large-scale um, it's a very complex interdisciplinary topic. It goes beyond just having panels that generate electricity of the type we have on our rooftops. Uh, we also have to consider things like uh, how you're going to do large scale energy storage because solar is intermittent, so we don't have uh, the solar all the time. We have to figure out how we're going to take these utility scale quantities of power and interface it with the grid, how we're going to deal with the intermittency in the grid. Um, and the, that's the transmission and distribution systems, and also what is going to be the impact on land and water and the environment. And so we put together a, uh, a team that brought together uh, folks from a variety of disciplines here at Stanford to focus on these different aspects of large-scale solar. So we held in 2011 uh, competitive proposals in, in these four thematic areas. So one was the solar energy conversion devices, one was energy storage, one was uh, effects on the grid, balancing intermittent supply with uh, demand. And then the, the fourth was land and water impacts. So um, the PIs from each of these four different projects is here. We actually funded five. Uh, we have four representatives here. And I've asked the uh, faculty that are going to speak and uh, be available for uh, panel uh, questions to focus on the opportunities and challenges that arise from the interconnectedness of these different considerations, the supply, the storage, the grid, and the land and water. So let me um, ask, if you don't mind coming up, the four. And I'll go ahead with just short introductions of all four of them. Please all come on up. Just leave one seat for me. Um, and uh, let me just go quickly uh, so I have time to give them uh, their due time for speaking. So uh, the first uh, speaker representing the solar uh, photovoltaics is Mike McGee. He's professor of material science and engineering. Uh, he's also a senior fellow in the Precord Institute for Energy. Um, he has a bachelor's in physics uh, from Princeton and a PhD in material science from UC Santa Barbara. His group studies photovoltaics, so he does a lot of work on organic semiconductors and nanostructured materials, and he's won a lot of awards. I'm going to limit my comments on awards to one because it's, uh, otherwise the list is too long. Uh, he won the MRS Outstanding Young Investigator Award. The second uh, faculty member to speak is going to be Tom Jaramillo, and he's going to talk about large-scale uh, storage. So Tom is an associate professor of chemical engineering. He got his bachelor's in uh, chemical engineering from Stanford and PhD also in chemi from uh, UC Santa Barbara. He's also the deputy director of the SunCat uh, Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. So his research focuses on catalysis, particularly for heterogeneous catalysis and electrocatalysis. And he's won numerous awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. The third uh, presentation is going to be given by David Lobel, who's going to represent the effects on land and water. David is associate professor in environmental earth system science. He's also a senior fellow in the Center on Food Security and the Environment and the Woods Institute for the Environment. Uh, he got his, a degree in applied math from Brown and a PhD in geological and environmental sciences from here at Stanford. He's won many awards. Most recently, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. And his research is at the interface between agriculture and climate. And the fourth uh, speaker is going to be Ram Rajagopal, who's going to represent or talk about the interface with the grid and how we deal with intermittency um, 
uh, of the supply. Uh, Ram is an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering. He got his uh, PhD in electrical engineering computer science uh, from UC Berkeley. He also has a master's in statistics uh, and another degree um, master's in electrical engineering. He studies renewable energy, particularly smart grid, uh, and he looks at algorithms for doing forecasting of load, dynamic response, and also energy policy. So with that and that series of introductions, I actually would like to hand uh, the mic over to uh, Mike McGee down at the end, who can tell us about the photovoltaics. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have to look at the slides here. Uh, so I'll do my best to summarize uh, what uh, Jen Dion's uh, group and my group uh, did uh, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, her group uh, developed uh, better um, upconverters for solar. And uh, the idea here is that we want to harvest the uh, infrared photons that are typically not absorbed by a solar cell. Normally, uh, anywhere from 30 to 50% of the light uh, uh, is below band gap, and it goes through the cell. And so the idea is to have a material that can absorb it. And for every two photons that are absorbed, uh, there will be one higher energy photon uh, re-emitted um, that can go back uh, into the uh, solar cell. And so we can harvest uh, some of that energy. And uh, uh, her group has uh, explored a lot of the materials that are out there and that could be used. And uh, one of the ones they've worked with are lanthanide doped uh, nanoparticles. And uh, here uh, you can see that when they shine uh, infrared light uh, through, uh, you can see the green uh, light that's being emitted uh, because of the um, upconversion. And uh, in this plot, you see uh, where the material absorbs out there in the infrared. And then um, out here, you see that uh, it, it emits around uh, uh, 500 to 550 uh, nanometers. Um, here are uh, calculations of um, how much of an enhancement there can be uh, in the efficiency. And the different lines are uh, for, um, let's say, 20% upconversion efficiency, 50%, 100%. And you see, and over, over here is the absolute boost. And uh, potentially, we could get about four or five percentage points improvement uh, in a solar cell um, if this was working uh, uh, perfectly well. Um, and you see some of the challenges is that it doesn't absorb over as wide of a spectral range as we would like. And then right now, the upconverters are only about 2 to 10 uh, percent uh, efficient. Uh, uh, very recently, um, her group has come up with a completely uh, new scheme for upconversion that could extend the spectral coverage and raise the efficiency. And the idea is that there are semiconducting quantum dots or quantum wells um, uh, at an interface with metal. And uh, the, the Fermi level of uh, the metal hits right at the middle of the band gap uh, for the semiconductor. And then if uh, light with about half the band gap is absorbed, an electron can go up and over a barrier and then get trapped in a region with a smaller gap. And likewise, if um, uh, a hole absorbs, then it can uh, go down here and end up and get trapped. And so with two separate light absorption events, we can get an electron and hole over uh, here, and then emission can occur from that point. <clears throat> and they've already uh, prototyped it, and uh, it's uh, already looking promising. Now uh, switching uh, to um, the solar cell, my, my group uh, made the uh, solar cells. And uh, during the time of the project, uh, perovskite semiconductors have emerged as a uh, really nice uh, candidate here. You can see the efficiency of solar cells made with these materials um, go from 4% uh, to over 20% uh, in uh, just a few uh, years. And uh, the band gap is uh, tunable, and, and we can uh, make the higher band gaps that work well with um, upconverters. Uh, my group uh, put silver nanowire uh, electrodes on top, and we already had a bottom transparent electrode. And so this is a, a completely or a highly transparent uh, solar cell, which is what we need uh, for the um, low band gap photons to be able to go all the way through and uh, be absorbed by the um, upconverter. 
Uh, we've also uh, gone ahead and made tandems. Um, instead of having an up converter, you can have two solar cells, one that harvests the high energy photons and one that gets the low energy photons. And for example, we've shown that uh, we can take a 17% cell made with copper indium gallium selenide, or we've done this with silicon as well, and we can boost that uh, to 18.6 using the uh, perovskite cell. And uh, that just came out in uh, energy and environmental science a couple of weeks ago. And that's about all I can say in five minutes. Great, thank you. We're gonna um, move on then to Tom Jaramillo. All right, I'll stand on this side. So uh, thank you very much. Um, our role in this Tomcat project is not so much on the production of electricity, but the storage of electricity. So what I want to talk to you about is our efforts through our project to develop pressure metal free regenerative fuel cells for storing large scale renewable electricity. And this is the idea. We all know that electricity generated from solar or from wind is intermittent in nature. It would be wonderful if we could actually store that in devices that cost less than about $100 per kilowatt hour. This is an extremely aggressive target. And of course, there are many, many different technological ways that one can store electricity. The question is, what's scalable and what's cheap? And frankly, we don't have the answers to both of those questions simultaneously in any technology today. So what we've been focusing on are these regenerative fuel cells that really take advantage of the fact that chemical fuels have a tremendous uh, form of storing energy. It's a really dense way to store uh, energy, and we can convert that from electricity to chemicals and chemicals to electricity back and forth again. I'll be telling you about a device we've been de developing called an AEM-URFC. What does that stand for, you ask? It's an alkaline anion exchange membrane unitized regenerative fuel cell. And the concept is it's in a single unit, a single device, where when you do have the wind blowing and the sun shining, you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen. You store it locally. And whenever you need that electricity back again, you flow it right back through the exact same device that operates as a fuel cell, recombining the hydrogen and oxygen to produce water and getting electricity out. Now, this is a technology that NASA has been using for decades and decades. However, those systems are extremely expensive because they require precious metals. Uh, and so what we've been trying to develop is a precious metal free analog that can work at low temperatures to make them easy to couple to intermittent sources such as these. So the project goals were really uh, two efforts on fundamental science, one in developing non-precious metal catalysts, another one in developing membrane materials. This is my uh, colleague and partner in this project, per Professor Kurt Frank from Chemical Engineering. And what we're, our, really our ultimate goal is to develop uh, one of these prototype devices and have these fundamental scientific efforts feed into uh, the improvement of said device. So on the catalysis effort, there are four reactions we're looking to catalyze. We're trying to catalyze hydrogen evolution from water, catalyze hydrogen oxidation, as well as catalyzing oxygen evolution from water and oxygen reduction to water. So four separate reactions. I won't go into the details, but really we've been combining theory and experiment to uh, teach us as to what are interesting, uh, interesting motifs to look for from a catalytic point of view to execute these reactions as effectively as we want. And then we want to integrate them into a device construct. And so this is what our first devices look like. This is the fuel cell hardware. This is something you can hold in the palm of your hand. It's about a five square centimeter device here. It's basically two electrodes sandwiching a, a piece of plastic uh, that serves as the electrolyte. And we were able to accomplish this with no precious metals whatsoever using nickel-based and manganese-based catalysts. We were able to run this device both in water electrolysis mode to split water when you do have electricity, and then run it in fuel cell mode to get that electricity back out. And our very, this is the very first prototype ever reported of a low temperature URFC that is completely free of precious metals. Now it operates at very modest efficiencies, 30 to 40 percent, and it's fairly cyclable, but clearly, uh, this, at least the, the proof has been shown that this can be done. The question is, how can we make this more efficient and more stable? One way that we improve the stability is actually getting rid of carbon from one of the electrodes. It turns out that as you're churning out oxygen from water, you're, you're churning out, uh, uh, you're basically chewing up the carbon. So we switched to stainless steel and we were able to get improvements both in terms of performance and, and efficiency as well as durability. We've also been looking into membranes, and this is really the, the role of uh, my colleague Kurt in this project, of developing block copolymers based on polysulfones, polyethylene glycol, and grafting onto these, these quaternary ammonium groups. And if you can do this in just the right way, which they've been able to accomplish, you can create these domains of 5 to 10 nanometers where you can actually let, it forms like a water channel that allows uh, anions to be conducted through the membrane. This is a, a visual photograph of what the membrane looks like. And in fact, these materials that they've been developing are state of the art performance for alkaline membranes that are in the field. 
So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Tomcat for allowing us to launch this project. It's an exciting uh, possibility ahead in terms of grid scale storage, avoiding precious metals altogether. Thank all the wonderful students and postdocs who worked on, on both teams. Uh, Desmond and Steve are gearing up to defend their theses uh, in a couple of months. Yelena is a Humboldt fellow uh, in Germany. Maureen has started her faculty position at uh, Drexel. And thank some of the collaborators uh, that work in the Suncat group of theory, led by Thomas Bligard, who provides support on some of those experiments. So thank you. Much, Tom. Uh, let me hand this over to David. Okay. You can see the optimism of people who work in solar because they get three minutes and they they put up fifteen slides. Um, it was only nine, I think. Nine, okay. <laughs> and it worked too. I mean, I, I was much less optimistic. I didn't prepare slides given given the time. Um, I'll just explain a little bit about our project. So I'm here representing a group of uh, myself, um, Chris Field, and Noah Diffenbaugh. Uh, and the project is really kind of on the tail end of what we're talking about, which is that what if this all works and what if large scale solar becomes truly large scale? What does that potentially imply for the environment? Are there things we should be thinking about that we aren't? Um, and in particular, we were looking at issues around land and water um, effects and also feedbacks to the climate system. So I'll, I'll kind of explain those um, briefly. On the, um, on the water side, I mean, obviously, a lot of these are going into very water scarce regions um, and and water you know is is predominantly used for agriculture which is the area I study so the question is if these systems come in are they going to be a major um, competition for agriculture and more importantly maybe is there a way to sort of co-integrate these systems in an intelligent way and so the a bulk of the project, and this was done by a postdoc, was trying to find out actual numbers on how much water is used in these systems. It's not exactly advertised by people um, applying for permits for these things. And what we found was, you know, nowadays a little bit more widely known, but three or four years ago wasn't, which is that CSP systems are using a lot of water. They're right up there with, with all sorts of traditional energy um, producers. PV is obviously, or maybe not obviously, PV uses a lot less water, but it still uses a pretty significant amount of water for, especially for the construction part and then also for the cleaning, the regular cleaning. So most systems in operation, not that there are a lot of them, are, are cleaning about weekly. They're using about 100 millimeters of water roughly in a, in a year. And in a dry place that gets 250 millimeters for a year, that's a pretty significant amount of water. So I think in terms of the land footprint, it was much smaller. Water was really where the impact was, but it also got us thinking hard about, well, this water is not really consumptive use. It's used to wash off the, uh, the panels. This water then flows down to the ground. Is there an intelligent way, as I said before, to co-locate agriculture? And so we started looking at analyzing systems that either had agave in the southwest of the U.S. or now we're looking at aloe plants in, in parts of India, looking at what is the actual economic potential and what is the sort of energy um, returns and, and value returns uh, on integrating these systems. And it turns out that 100 millimeters is, is pretty much what you need for a plantation of agave or for a plantation of aloe for that matter. So actually the numbers when you work them out um, look quite good and there's really very little uh, reduction in the efficiency of the solar PVs on the one hand and there's very little reduction in the, in the productivity of these, of these biofuel or crop systems on the other hand because you know, shade, a little bit of shade in the desert is not such a bad thing. Um, just in, in the last 30 seconds, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the climate feedbacks, which is still kind of underway. But the idea is if you have these big, large arrays in these formerly very bright, deserty areas, this actually could have a pretty significant impact on local air circulation. Um, it's been kind of posited that this could be big enough to really affect local climate. So we are in the midst of trying to do simulations that we think are credible looking at those feedbacks. It seems like it would take probably and Noah's here, I think he can, he can obviously correct me in, in the Q&A, but I, I think it would take a pretty big success in terms of solar PV to be enough to, um, to matter at, at the large scale in terms of regional climate. But there are definitely feedbacks locally that are, that are potentially of interest and potentially of, um, uh, you know, worth thinking about as these systems come online. Thank you. Uh, you have David, a yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Is there a control for oh, that? Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about a different idea we had. So one of the issues when you try to integrate large-scale solar is the variability of solar. So it's not like your traditional power plants. And typically what people have said, well, because of that variability, we need to have all kinds of resources to back up solar power. And 
In that mode of thinking, you're always thinking loads are formed by these blocks of consumption that are inflexible. But in fact, we can think about our consumption as having this characteristic of flexibility. So in this project, what we wanted to do is to quantify how much of this flexibility is available with consumers. Second, how to achieve this flexibility. So is there contracts or some type of financial mechanism to do that? And third, how to implement it in practice, how to operationalize it with your algorithms. So the first thing that we found is that to do all of this, you need to really start looking at data and mix them with algorithms. But in fact, you can define solar production as kind of a new commodity. So instead of thinking, I want one kilowatt of electricity for one hour, you can say, I want one kilowatt delivered in the next so many hours. And that, in fact, you can show that good can be sold, traded, and in fact, contracts can be designed. So we wrote papers on all of that. And the next part was to assess how much of this flexibility is available um, with consumers. So we did two types of project. Um, one, we looked at smart meter data. So this is a long-term effort we have been having here at Stanford. And we determined basically that first, about 60% of a household load is typically variable. And in fact, if you think about those blocks, we consume power in about 10 of those blocks, which last for an hour or two. So you can imagine if I have to do that activity inside the same day, I have a ton of flexibility. Now, to evaluate this in practice, what we had proposed was to implement this on a residential scale. For that, we needed algorithms, and we needed a test case. For the algorithms, my students developed here, uh, working with some faculty, um, like Professor Abbas al -Gamal in the electrical engineering department. And for the test case, we found this deployment in Texas where they monitor every single home and all the appliances inside them. And what we found when we combined the algorithms and the data from the test case is that by moving um, appliance use and activities in your house, such as turning on your pool pump and so on, by about an hour or two, you can equivalently match solar with that action. And it corresponds to something like having 30% of your house worth of storage. So that is our um, observation. And these algorithms are published, and there is some companies here who are trying to use it um, as part of their solution. So that's what we did, and this kind of ongoing work as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. So, I, OK, let me, let, why don't we <laughs> But they're not off the hook yet. Uh, we have quite a bit more we want to ask them. But let me just give you a little idea of the rest of the program here. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to, ask one question of each of the panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions from uh, the audience. Students first, please. And then after this, we're going to have a reception and poster session that highlights the work, uh, some of the projects, not just from the Tomcat Center, but also the Precord Institute for Energy and the Precord Energy Efficiency Center. So after we're done here, I uh, invite you to join us all for uh, the reception, which will have food and drinks, as well as wonderful scientific discussion right outside of this room. So uh, let me start with uh, a question for um, Ram. Let me work, work backwards. And, and this is really maybe a question that ties in with what Tom was talking about. From your understanding of the grid, um, can you comment on what sort of responsiveness you would need in terms of the storage, uh, how quickly you need to turn that on? So um, can, do you need your storage to be instantaneously available, or can you do some sort of forecasting which says, OK, Tom, if you have this unitized regenerative fuel cell, we're going to need it to come online an hour from now? Yeah. So, so um, all the studies of the grid in terms of integration of renewables, what they have shown is that roughly you need two types of um, backup or reserves. One is, in your day ahead, you can predict how much solar energy is going to be produced on that day. And during that energy scheduling process, in which we schedule about 90%, 80 to 90% of our energy, there's going to be some amount of storage. That storage response can be slow, because it's scheduled a day in advance. Um, there is a second part, which is that those forecasts are going to be inaccurate. And as you update to the reality of what actually is produced in real time, that's typically you know five minute intervals 
or, or so, uh, you need to schedule other types of generation. That process happens anyway, starting from an hour in advance of each 15 to five minute interval, all the way to inside the interval itself. And there you may need faster storage, or an alternative is to store energy in the form of not using. So you can have demand response, or you can have uh, load shifting, which, which can have that capability as well. OK, great. Thank you. David, a question for you about photovoltaic design, so you can help inform perhaps what Mike uh, and his colleagues work on. Uh, you mentioned that the effect you think on climate uh, from NOAA's studies and uh, others is maybe showing that it's not going to be a huge effect, but uh, do you think there's anything in the design of the photovoltaic that you would propose could mitigate what effect there is? There's something that one should think about in designing panels that would make the effect on climate less significant? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, as I think about it, um, you know, the more efficient these cells get, as I understand, I mean, the less heat they're dissipating locally and the more they're converting it into electricity and that's being taken away to be used. So in terms of the, the one of the main concerns about solar cells, you got these big dark absorbers on the ground. Um, but if, if all those electrons are being, you know, actually um, taken into electricity, then it's less of a, potentially less of a climate effect. I think probably at the bigger scale though, the, the bigger issue may well be how much can you, you know, extract out of that land and water that you're using for other purposes so that you then reduce the need for those other uses on, on lands that are, that are nearby. And those, those um, kind of co-benefits could, in the end, be more important for the regional or global climate effect than, than whatever's happening on that piece of land in terms of the energy balance. OK, great. Thank you. Question for Tom about storage. So you talked about one type of energy storage, the uh, unitized regenerative fuel cell. But I'm wondering what you think is also exciting on the horizon. You showed sort of a distribution. And I'm, I'm actually wondering in particular about batteries, because with the uh, mm -hmm. Gigafactory coming <clears throat> online with Tesla um, and production going up and bringing costs down on, say, lithium ion batteries, do you see that as a realistic large-scale storage strategy or do you think we're going to have to look for other types of devices of the type you're studying? I think batteries, uh, the current state, oh I'm mic'd up, thank you Stacy. I, I, I think the current state of batteries means that here today there are market opportunities to deploy batteries for grid scale storage. Um, it's going to be niche markets, it'll be in very specific locations where you can take advantage of really cheap electricity and so you can, you can deploy that today but the question is can you scale that to effectively the terawatt scale which is where we want to be and that, that's a much more challenging question and I think there's no, um, there's no obvious pathway that we'll get there but I think there, there is certainly a lot of other promising pathways to try and attempt. So I don't think there's any one answer that anyone can feel very secure that we will get to terawatt uh, energy storage that one can couple to photovoltaics and have it be as cheap as coal or as cheap as natural gas. I mean, uh, I think the issue is that we all need to appreciate how inexpensive those amazing fossil fuels are and everything that they do for us. And it's a very tough price point to meet. Um, but I do think that uh, chemical bonds is a wonderful way to store energy. Um, and so for the unitized regenerative fuel cells, it's unclear there too. Um, for the batteries, there might be hope. And everyone should walk away here knowing at least that pumped hydro is the number one form of storing electricity large scale today. It is hitting price points, as I was showing earlier, about $100 a kilowatt or so. The only problem is it's not scalable. It only works in certain locations. So if you happen to live in Switzerland and you have the Alps in your backyard, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. So Mike, a question for you about photovoltaics, and in particular, um, I'm wondering if you could relate uh, maybe anything on the horizon in, that uh, is in photovoltaics with concentrating solar power. And, and let me uh, explain what I'm getting at here. So with concentrating solar power, uh, one of the things that makes that desirable um, is that it has sort of built-in storage, right, because of the thermal capacity of, of your fluid. So. Is there anything we could be thinking about with photovoltaics device itself that can take advantage of um, some storage aspect? Or is it always going to be have to have some separate device like a unitized regenerative fuel cell that can separately store the energy and, and bring it back? Well, you asked for short answers, so no and yes. <laughs> Not that short. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I think we're mixing different technologies mm -hmm. here. Right. And uh, the, the solar thermal that has storage built mm -hmm. in is not based on photovoltaics. It's not right. a semiconductor device. And you're, yeah, you're heating a fluid and, and the fluid can stay hot for yes. a while and you can use it to uh, generate steam and run a turbine at mm -hmm. night if, if you want. Um, but uh, yeah, photovoltaics don't work well at elevated temperatures. So it's, uh, I mean, you know, uh, Ziek Shen and Nick <laughs> Malosh have done something that I still wouldn't call a photovoltaic, but uh, a device that uh, does produce electricity directly and it works well at elevated temperatures. It's a thermionic device. Right. And uh, then you have the opportunity to, to, to use uh, both of those things. But with solar, it's uh, with a photo photovoltaic. Um, mm -hmm. The I'm not a big fan of cramming all the different devices into one thing mm -hmm. if they can work perfectly well side by side. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let me just follow up since that one you you know didn't like that question. Let me ask you about the prospect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you to bet on the future here, since I pushed Tom to have to say something about you know what storage technology is going to win. Do you see uh, the perovskites uh, having a future in large-scale solar uh, as as sort of an add-on? I know your group is studying that to kind of current silicon technology for these sorts of applications. Do you do you project that this uh, technology will find its way into utility-scale solar? Well, the efficiency will almost certainly get to where it needs to be. Uh, the cost of manufacturing will almost certainly be uh, very exciting, lower than anything that we've ever seen. So the, the dollars per watt will be the best um, of any technology out there. But the stability is a very serious concern. And uh, it's too early to tell if it's going to be possible to get 25 year lifetime. So it'll, it'll all hinge on whether or not the cells are stable enough. OK, great. Well, I've <coughs> hogged enough of the time up here asking questions. So let me turn it over now to the audience. I'm sure our panelists would be more than happy to answer questions. Uh, they'll tell you if they don't like the question. And uh, <laughs> um, let's see. So. Anyone have a question for our panelists? Oh, it's doing. Okay, I think I saw this hand up first. Why don't oh, we start with that, and then we'll uh, then we'll move. On. I was wondering if uh, this is for the like environmental impact of solar. Um, I know that's kind of like not really thought out yet, but um, is do you guys have any sense of like if PVs versus like solar thermal would have like one or the other would be better or have weird differences or anything like that on like a gigawatt or multi gigawatt scale locally? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the, the solar PVs use a lot less water. So, I mean, I think that's kind of the, the main take home from that. And they're using, again, you know, more, more water than a lot of people think, and they're using enough water that it could be useful for other purposes after it's used to clean. I mean, I should say also that there, there are technologies being tested out to clean without the use of water. So um, PVs could even go lower. But CSP, as I understand it, you know, is, is, um, is really inherently pretty uh, water demanding, that there's not really, a, in the short term at least, a, a way around that. So I, I would say that that, to me, would be the main one. Did you have a question? Please. Yeah, my question was about the upconversion solar cells. So you have to build some focusing devices inside the cells to get enough intensity for upconversion, or do they just work with the natural ambient Great. intensity? Some of the upconversion schemes do require high light intensity because uh, two molecules need to be in the excited state and encounter each other. Um, but the new scheme, uh, I don't believe, requires high intensity. Uh, so that, that's part of what makes it uh, really exciting. And the, um, 
what Jin Dion's group is doing is, is not necessarily using a big lens to focus the light, but rather using nanostructured metal and plasmonic effects uh, to create just really nanometer sized spots where the light intensity is uh, very high. Okay, why don't we go to you there? Yep. Um, so this is a question on storage. Uh, for the device that you've showed, you've said that the, the full cycle efficiency was 40%. Can you break that down into uh, how much of efficiency is related to electrolysis and what part is related to the conversion of hydrogen back to electricity? And where are the major losses in the system? Right, so the efficiency is about the same in both directions. Um, and actually, that comes down to the fact that uh, when you're going from O2 to H2O or H2O to O2, you basically run into the same, it's the same reaction, right? And so the kinetics are actually fairly similar and the same, you run into the same pitfalls. Um, that 30 to 40% that I was quoting, just to compare it versus other technologies, the battery in your cell phone in your pocket is probably about 80 or so percent uh, round trip efficiency, and pumped hydro is about 80%, and that's kind of a number that's a, a solid uh, target if we're thinking grid scale storage, that's, that's where you want to be. There's one other point when you talk about round trip efficiencies, it also has to do, you also have to think about what's the power. Uh, input or power output. So generally speaking, uh, the higher the rate of power transfer, the lower the efficiency will go. So that's an important number to couple into that equation. So you add all these things up, and that's why I said this is kind of a, we, we proved that we can develop not just the concept, but also we can prove we can make the technology, but it's still very far from targets uh, for mass uh, commercialization. So I think, and, and the way you approach efficiency with a device like this is you have to make better catalysts. The catalysts are what, they do all the bond breaking and bond making, and so that's why the fundamental science of building better catalysts is so important to building a better device. Sorry, just a quick follow-up. How does that compare to the efficiency of like current commercial electrolyzers that are built by Siemens and, and other companies? So uh, I would say that it's uh, in the same ballpark uh, as those. It's you know, using really good non-precious catalysts. I mean, we're, we're leveraging decades of knowledge. So their devices are more efficient devices because of the, you know, the massive engineering that has gone into those devices as opposed to our prototype where we haven't, for instance, maximized mass transfer the way that they have. Um, so, you know, in principle, they could hit the same efficiencies, but even that efficiency wouldn't be good enough, I think, for large-scale grid, sto uh, grid storage. If you took the best state-of-the-art fuel cell, the best state-of-the-art electrolyzer, you know, you're still at 50% uh, round trip efficiency. Yeah. Okay, let's see, why don't we go here next. Um, I have a question. Uh, you seem to have, have left out the, the environmental effects on species. For instance, the new Ivanpah, uh, two billion or so plus solar concentrator kills birds in a very cruel way by burning their feathers and so they can't fly, they fall down and get eaten alive by rats in Southern California. So, it, and it also doesn't generate the power it was advertised to and we paid for two thirds of it for taxpayers. So, what's really being done to look at the environmental effects of something like concentrated solar? Yeah, I, um... You know, one of the challenges at the beginning of this project was, was kind of constraining ourselves because there was a long list of potential environmental concerns. Um, species definitely, not just for um, CSP, but for PV as well. And, and uh, especially in these, in these desert ecosystems that, you know, are often pretty fragile and, and you know, coming in with construction, for example, and, and um, perturbing the, the soil crust could, could take many decades to recover from and that there's all sorts of consequences. So, I, you know, it's not to um, say that we uh, chose these for any reasons other than we thought, you know, these were the ones that the data were available to make gains on. They may not be the most important ones. There's issues as well with concerns about sort of spreading um, valley fever that a lot of people in the Southwest are concerned about. Um, so, yeah, I, I think your point is well taken. Um, CSP, you know, has, has these particular issues with birds. Wind power has issues with birds, you know. Cats right, as pets well, have issues with birds. Yeah, I should say with all these things we're saying about CSP that are negative, they, they are becoming, as I understand it, you guys can correct me, they're becoming a little bit less popular, especially with the cost of PV coming down. But they're still, for example, in India, um, often putting in CSP in places that are extremely water scarce. And, it, and it, there are reasons in, in terms of cost, I guess, that they're still doing that. 
And if I can just add one, one thought, I mean, conventional power has its own set of environmental impact, too. So we do have to bear that in mind. I mean, these are all important questions, but certainly if you compare versus drilling for oil, drilling for natural gas. Are there any other student uh, questions before we go? OK, yeah, you in the back. Uh, a question with one step out. And I was, I'm wondering, since in conventional generation, the cogeneration of heat and power has the highest efficiencies, I'm wondering whether you could talk about cogeneration, uh, but potential, um, because I know both solar panels dissipate some heat diffusely, and uh, water, uh, the equivalent of burning of water, also dissipates some heat, which is why fuel cells are used for cogen. So maybe I could ask you to talk about generation of heat, possible transport, and storage of heat. Thank you. It was a question to me. I'm sorry I didn't catch that. Or was it? <laughs> Looks like you spoke first, Tom. Yes, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'd say uh, in, in principle one could, but uh, ideally you wouldn't, just, you wouldn't go to high temperatures in the first place, right? And what is one way you can get around those types of limitations if you can keep everything Cool, and that's why uh, that's why we're working on that particular type of fuel cell. People have made regenerative fuel cells that operate at 800 degrees C, and they work phenomenally well from an efficiency point of view. But uh, but that's 800 degrees C, and cycling with night and whatnot. Those are interesting questions. So, um, but I would say for any device that that does generate uh, heat, figuring out a way to capture it is great. Um, but it it's really hard to capture low grade heat, and that's a major. Question: if you, if you can come up with a good way to capture low-grade heat, convert it into electricity in a cost-effective way, that could be a game changer. You can couple that to lots of processes all over Earth and create electricity uh, seemingly for free. OK, please. About the water usage. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one is putting, uh, putting the solar cells on inexpensive racks, which can be done over roads and parking areas. Um, and you know, there's enough road surface in America to power America from one study that I read about years ago. So I don't remember this citation. Um, regarding the high heat, if you build the solar, like if you're building on roads, if you build concentrating solar, you know, trough or you know, trough or or whatever kind of solar concentrating and you're going for 200 to 600 suns you've got medium level heat which you can then deliver as heat for process heating use so instead of using an engine or electricity to generate the heat for a need for process heat you deliver it straight out of the solar system you guys address some of those ideas well the the problem with uh any scheme where you've allowed the, uh, if it's a solar cell, a photovoltaic cell, if you've allowed it to get hot enough that the, um, you know, the water, say, that you heat is useful, then the efficiency of the photovoltaic would have dropped tremendously. Um, you know, you, a photovoltaic, it's still reasonably efficient at 40, 50, 60 degrees, but above 100 degrees, uh, the efficiency is, is getting unacceptably low. So um, it's, it's just a hard trade-off. And you know, ZX Shen has come up with you know, a completely different approach where it is an electrical device, and it could work well at high temperatures. There are some but specific high temperature solar cells. I work with an inventor who worked with them. Um, well, if, if someone can figure out how to do that, that's great. But uh, yeah, I have not seen a cell. That, I mean, some work better than others, but I've never seen one that uh, that you know works really well. You know, say above 100 degrees. Yes. Uh, could you comment on the use of uh, flow batteries for energy storage? It seems like that allows massive scaling independently of power and energy. Sure thing. Uh, redox flow cells, very exciting technology, uh, really well suited for large scale applications. Um, effectively, what I was showing earlier is a, a flow cell or a flow battery. The difference is that there we're actually 
breaking and making all these bonds, whereas a redox flow cell, uh, you're flowing in, say, iron 2 plus and converting it to iron 3 plus or vanadium 4 plus to 5 plus and back and forth. And so they're really not, since you're not having to break all these bonds and make all these bonds, it's much easier kinetically, and thus your round trip efficiency can be much higher. So redox flow cells absolutely have uh, hit targets what, that, we're, that we're interested in, things like 80% round trip efficiency. Um, they've hit targets in terms of cyclability, since you're not breaking all these bonds, you're not asking like a battery electrode to, to be a sponge and soak up all these ions and kick them back out and go through all these phase transformations. Because you're avoiding all of that, you can end up with really good cycle life, 30,000 cycles, for instance. These are wonderful numbers, uh, but cost, uh, cost still remains a major challenge in that area. So uh, you can do some back of the envelope calculations. In fact, I'm teaching a class this quarter. Uh, some of the students are here in the audience on electrochemical energy conversion. And in class, we did a, a very quick back of the envelope calculation using the periodic table and stock market prices of metals to figure out which technologies might have uh, more legs than others, just based on buying your metal that you're using as your redox species. So, um, so it's it, you know to hit these targets of hundred dollars a kilowatt hour, it's really tough. It's still very promising though, and worth looking into. Uh, but the current state is that there's no, there are major uh, deployments around the world um, on the order of hundreds of kilowatt hours, uh, maybe even megawatt hours at this stage. But I mean, still, it's very very small potatoes in the uh, in the energy storage game. If I might throw in a question myself for Rom, actually, it's about uh, electric vehicles. So. If we can consider those in the grid, uh, can those be our large-scale energy storage instead of having to use uh, some electrochemical device that's not sitting inside our car? Yeah, so there's two parts to understand that question. One is uh, what is the potential to do that? So definitely you can use those vehicles. It has been demonstrated before. The problem is each time you cycle it through for a grid use, you are reducing the lifetime of the battery of your car. So the second question is whether it's economical to do that and consumers would accept that. And what people have seen up to now is that uh, the answer is no for that one. Just because there is a big reluctance on people to, to understand how much of a lifetime you lose in cycling. And second, the costs you get per kilowatt hour or, or, or megawatt hour generated for, from your battery uh, only compensate on, on a very small number of hours over the whole year. So that, I think, is a major obstacle. But I think the other exciting area has been discarded batteries. So there's a lot of projects that are reusing those discarded batteries and trying to figure out if they can integrate them as some form of storage. So again, there's challenges there. They were not designed for those purposes, and you have to do compatibility and so on. But. Yes. Right. Thank you. Okay. Yes. What are there potentially? Yeah, great question. So you know, the question is, what other, what other, what other chemistries uh, other than water splitting are worth looking into? And and water splitting is uh, we we started there for sure because water uh, is uh, certainly an environmental concern. But if it's a closed system. Uh, you can you know, go from water to H2 and O2 and back again and, and keep it enclosed. And you actually don't need that much water. There's so much energy intrinsically in these chemical bonds. Um, you know, other interesting chemistries, I would say, are ones involving CO2. Uh, in principle, you could go from CO2 to methanol, for instance, and back and forth again. Uh, the catalysts there are not nearly as good as water splitting. Um, and therefore, much lower efficiency devices if you tried that sort of construct. So. Um, as I encourage my own students, I would encourage everyone in the audience, if you're thinking about different you know, flow battery type chemistries, you, know, you can go into the periodic table and <clears throat> any molecule out there, you can, you can, do, you can technically do that. Te from a technological point of view, the question is, can you uh, hit the efficiency targets, the cyclability targets, and the, ultimately, of course, the cost targets? Yes. This is for Ron. So you're probably aware that New Zealand has a system of load shaving that they've had for decades using a, a stupid grid, just substation by substation. They put a low frequency signal out over the uh, power lines, telling a ripple switch to turn off power to water heaters. And given that uh, traditionally they were entirely in hydro, now they have some peaker gas plants, they're able to shave in peak loads, which saves, my understanding is shaving 5 or 10% of peak loads can save you 50% of your generating dollars. So I have, I'm wondering if you run their data through your models 
and or you know, ask, is that something that would be acceptable in the US? Can we get some mileage out of that without investing billions into smart grid infrastructure? We can use a stupid grid and, and have the same uh, effect. Yeah, so we talked to some of the operators there and they explain how the system works. It still requires some type of hardware so that these water heaters respond. And the interesting thing is the major change there is that the electricity you pay for those water heaters is charged separately and it's cheaper. So it's kind of like the contracts we design. They have a reliability. If your reliability is not 99.9%, .9%, you're going to pay much less for electricity. So I think in the US, there is thoughts like that already. And with the smart meters, the amount of additional infrastructure you need to achieve some of these things is very, very small. It's really more about um, finding exactly the amounts that you need and uh, actually having consumers uh, volunteer into these programs. That has been a little bit of a challenge because the effort, maybe you don't feel it, but just the effort of enrolling and all that has been an issue for utilities. OK, why don't we take the last two questions, you and then you. Uh, concerning environmental effects, have you considered high concentration solar PV 100 to 1,000 X? The ground coverage ratio goes down to about 15 percent. Environmental effects go way down. I'm not sure. Is that a question or? Have you considered that? That the, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Solar PV. Oh. Um, better environmental impact. We have not in our project looked at that. I don't know um, in terms of the technology, maybe Mike knows, is, is the high concentrating solar PV, a, you know, is it a likely scenario going forward? Well, I mean, there's I, two, I two we parts of that. that. I mean, it, the people who uh, market it do advertise that because it rotates during the day, uh, the, the land underneath can still pick up a lot of diffuse light and you can have uh, crops growing fairly normally underneath of it, which is certainly a plus. But, you know, it, it's just having a very hard time competing with flat plate PV. The, the um, you know, efficiency and cost are a lot better for flat plate, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of the two. And... Um, so certainly the you know the concentrated PV market is is struggling, and I don't think that benefit is enough uh, to cause many people to choose it. You know there would need to be big breakthroughs in the um, tracker and the you know the concentrator itself. I think for that to become competitive. Okay, final question. There have been several comments about uh, electrical and chemical storage. And, but a couple about physical storage. You mentioned pump storage. Um, what about uh, flywheels or any other kind of physical storage? Yeah, the, the mechanical-based storage, uh, right. There's many different types of storage. Um, those, they work. They're just too expensive. And it's not, I mean, <clears throat> not clear from my perspective that there are obvious ways to reduce those costs to get you there. Uh, so I mean, you could use, for instance, uh, superconductors uh, to store electricity by running that electricity through coils with zero resistance. And then whenever you want to get that energy, that electricity back out, sure. Uh, but until the day that we have a room temperature superconductor, that's not really going to be cost feasible. Um, uh, flywheels uh, work fantastic. They technologically absolutely work. It's not clear to me that I see a path to getting them roughly the order of magnitude that they would have to decrease in price to, to be deployable again at the terawatt type of scale. Um, these types of mechanisms are used in small scale and again niche markets and things, but uh, it's not clear to me you know, what, the, what that trajectory is. Though to be perfectly frank, I'm a chemical engineer uh, responding to questions that maybe somebody in the mechanical engineering world would <laughs> be better off for answering. Thank you for your question, though. It's a good question. OK, with that, let me uh, thank the panel uh, for great uh, discussion and great presentations. And uh, join me in thanking them, please.